All right, today we are going to continue our discussion of functions by moving forward to inverse functions. So we have kind of a fundamental question we want to ask ourselves today, and that's if the inverse relation, f inverse, is actually a function. Is the inverse relation, f inverse, a function, right? That's the fundamental question that we seek to answer today. So why don't we start off with an example for a second. Let's let a and b be sets, right? So let's let a equal 1, 2, 3, 4, and b equal, let's just do 5, 6, 7, and 8. Now we're going to let f map a to b um, be defined as this. Oh, that's the wrong letter be defined as this. We'll say f is equal to the set. And let's do ordered pairs. How about we do 1, 5. Uh, let's do 2, 5. Let's do, I don't, I don't know, 3, 6. And then how about 4, 7. And we can verify this is a function real quick. We could see that our entire, from a to b, our domain is all of a. And each input has a unique output. So we don't have inputs going to multiple outputs. So this is indeed a function, right? And now let's define F inverse, the inverse relation. So have, let's say, F inverse, right? The inverse relation is just made by reversing the order of the, by reversing the elements in each ordered pair in F, recall inverse relations. So we have f inverse will be equal to 5, 1, let's see, 5, 2, uh, 6, 3, and 7, 4, right? Now, what I want to know is, uh, does f, Matt, is f a function? Here is f inverse a function such that f inverse maps b to a. What do you think? The answer is a striking no. Why is that? Well, there's two reasons, actually. One, let's look at one. Uh, inputs do not have unique outputs. You'll see five maps to one and two. Five maps to one and two, right? And we can't have that in a function. So our inputs do not have unique outputs. Do not have unique outputs. So that's one reason. The other one, I don't think is as obvious, right? So we're asking if f, the inverse relation f inverse is a function from b to a. But notice that we don't even cover the entire domain of b, right? We have 5, 6, and 7. What about 8, right? Our domain isn't even equal to b. So no, that's another reason why this is not a function mapping b to a. Our domain, uh, here, let's just say um, the domain of f inverse does not equal b, right? So this is an example where we can have our inverse relation, right? But it's not necessarily a function, right? So how can we determine when it is a function? Well, first, we're going to have to define something, right? What we're going to define is what it means to be one to one, right? So let's talk about that. One, two, one. And in parentheses, I'll write this one to one, because that's how that's a little notation sometimes people use. You know, it's just better than writing one to one all the time. Although you'll probably see me write one to one throughout this entire video. So anyway, what's our definition? So a function f, a function f is called, now let's, let's be color coordinated again, is called one to one, one to one. Function f is called one to one provided provided that whenever we have whenever we have x b and y b in our func in our relation f, we must have we must have that x is equal to y, right? 
So in other words, in other words, if x is not equal to y, then f of x, f of x, will not equal f of y. So that's true, right? And so this is our definition of one-to-one. -one. And one-to-one -one just basically means that each input, um, that if we have, okay, <laughs> one-to-one -one basically is saying, uh, as it says in the definition, that each thing, each input goes to a unique output. So if we think about f of x equaling x squared, right, this is not one-to-one, -one, right? Well, why is that, right? Let's look at our definition. Well, for our relation f, right, negative 2 comma 4 and 2 comma 4 are both in this relation, right? Because negative 2 squared is 4 and 2 squared is 4. However, negative 2 does not equal 2. So that's why it would not be 1 to 1. We have multiple inputs being sent to the same output. We can't have that in a 1 to 1 function. And just as a little side note, this is just like something that makes intuitive sense, right? So it's just a little side note, right? So if f is a function mapping a to b is 1 to 1, 1 to 1, then at the very least, the size of a must be less than or equal to the size of b, right? Because if we have more elements in a than we do in b, then obviously at least two elements will be sent to the same output in B. Now, that intuitive reasoning I just used is a little teaser for what we'll be doing next video, but we'll get to that. We'll get to that. I'll talk about it towards the end of this one. So, now, let's look at a, let's look at a little proposition. I have a proposition for us, and we're actually going to prove it. That's fun, right? Doing proofs can be fun. So, proposition. Here's what I'm going to prove. Let's say, let F be a function, right? I'm not going to specify a domain or image or anything. I'm just going to say, let f be a function. The inverse relation, the inverse relation, f inverse is a function. It is a function if and only if f is one to one. This is actually a really straightforward proof. I was considering just leaving it as an exercise, but like, I guess I'll do it. You know, it could be helpful to, if it can be helpful to at least one person, then that's reason for doing it. So let's do this. And so, like I said, this can be easy. We're going to follow straight from our definitions, essentially, right? So first, let's suppose, suppose f inverse is a function. What does that mean? Well, if f inverse is a function, right? From our definition of being a function, then we know that whenever that whenever a b and a c are in f, we must have b is equal to c right? That's just our definition of being a well-defined function, right? So thus, when we reverse the elements, when we reverse the elements, I'm going to write which yields the relation f, right? The inverse of f inverse is just f, which yields f. We know that when we have when we have b a oh i didn't write a little comma b a and c a and f and remember this is just from reversing a b and a c earlier so we know that when we have b a and c a and f it must be the case it must be the case that b is equal to c, right? And we know b is equal to c because f inverse is a function, right? That came from our supposition that f inverse is a function. Now this, what I just wrote, 
is just the definition of being one to one, right? So then, by definition, F is one to one. Now that was just one direction of our if and only, one direction of our if and only if proof. I'm sorry, that was cringe. Um, and you can see that, that only took like three sentences. It's probably going to take like three or four sentences for the other direction because we're just unraveling definitions. It's a really easy proof. Okay, so now let's suppose, suppose F is one to one, right? What does that mean? Well, then we know that whenever X, B, and Y, B are in F. So let's say X, B, and Y, B are in F. It must be the case that X is equal to Y. Straight from our definition of being one-to-one, -one, right? Then, whenever we have... Let's do this. Whenever we have bx comma by in f inverse, right? And this is coming from reversing the order, reversing the elements in each ordered pair of the relation f. So whenever we have bx by in f inverse, we know x is equal to y, right? So f inverse is a function, right? And this is just straight from the definition of being a function, right? And this is the end of our proof. Super simple. I could have left it to an exercise, but I wanted us to have this time together, you know, get some proof practice in. All right, anyway, let's talk about just another quick fact, right? Say another fact that we could say about functions now. So we're gonna let f be a function. And let f inverse be a function. Then the domain of f is going to be equal to the image of f inverse and the domain of f inverse is equal to the image of f. Now, okay. This is one I'm not going to prove. I leave this as an exercise to the viewer. You can do it yourself. I, I'm sure you can handle it. But moving on, let's do another definition. We spoke about one to one. Now I want to talk about what it means to be on two, because this is important, right? And then we're going to combine our definitions of being one to one and on two to yield some pretty nifty results. So let's let F be a function mapping A to B, right? We say that F is, let's go back to our blue, we say that F is onto B, F is onto B provided that for all little b in the set B, there exists an A in the set A such that f of a is equal to b. Now, let's let's make some sense of this, right? And i.e., in other words, in other words, let's just say the image of f is equal to b. Now, remember last video we talked about functions. We said that the it, that the image um, doesn't necessarily need to be equal to b, just a subset of b. Well, if f is onto b, that means that the image is equal to b. So that means for all elements of B, right, we have some element from A that gets mapped to B. So we cover the entirety of the set B. Up the, here, let's draw a picture. Let's draw a picture, right? This is A, and this is B. And let's just, let's make A larger than B, right? Because that could be the case. It doesn't have to be. They could be the same size. But the important thing here is that all of B gets mapped to, see, we've already done that. All of B gets covered, right? We Everything from B, every element of B 
has at least one element of A that gets mapped to it. So that's what it means to be onto, right? And so, like with um, being one-to-one, -one, we said that the size of A um, must be less than or equal to B. We're going to say if F A, we're going to say if F mapping A to B is onto B, then surely the size of A must be greater than or equal to B, right? We need to have at least as many elements in A as we do in B so that it can be possible for us to cover all of B, right? That should, that should make sense. You can't be onto if A, if the size of A is less than B. You don't have enough elements to go there. Hopefully that makes some sense. All right, we are almost done. Now I just want to write out quick theorem. And I say quick, guess why? Because I am not going to prove it. That's why it's quick. Theorem. All right, what is our theorem going to be? So we're going to let A and B be sets, first and foremost. And we're going to let F be a function mapping A to B, right? The inverse relation, the inverse relation, and right now we're answering our fundamental question that we asked at the beginning of this video. The inverse relation, F inverse, is a function. It is in fact a function. If and only here, and let's write it's a function um, mapping B to A if and only if F is onto and one to one. Now, why is that, right? I'm going to just like give you some intuition for where you could go with the proof since I'm not going to actually be doing it myself. Let's draw a picture, right? Now, remember what I said about being one to one, right? So I said if we're one to one, the size of A is equal to the size of B, right? You're not actually going to be using this in your proof, really. And then being on to, oh, sorry, not equal to. If it's one to one, it's less than or equal to. If it's on to, size of A is greater than or equal to size of B. Thus, if it's one to one and on to, that was supposed to be an and symbol, and on to, then we have the size of A will be equal to B, right? And this should make sense then, right? Because then we know that not only does every element of A get mapped to a specific element of B, also the entirety of B is covered by A, right? Every element in B has an element of A such that F of A is equal to B, right? So that means we can go the reverse direction. We can define a function f inverse going in the reverse direction, right? Such that f inverse of b will be equal to a, right? So that's like just some intuition for why this makes sense and why f inverse can only be a function mapping b to a if and only if f is onto and one to one in the first place. And one quick little note right before I go. We're going to have a little definition. I'm just going to write definition. If f is a function that is one to one and onto, that is okay, one to one and onto, we say that f is a bijection. So a function is a bijection. Definitions are if and only if statements. A function is a bijection if and only if it is one to one and onto. And bijection moving forward is a word you're going to hear all the time, right? What's the point in saying one to one and onto when you can just say bijection? It's really easy. But there we go. That is all we have for today. We answered our fundamental question that we wanted to ask in the beginning of this video was if the inverse relation f inverse is a function. We finally did that. We saw a nice little if and only if proof. I thought it was nice. And yeah, that is going to end our discussion of functions for today. I said that I would tease the next video at the end of this one, which is um the pigeonhole principle, right? And that had to deal with the size of sets. And we're going to go back to the converse of that statement to discuss the pigeonhole principle. But anyway, 
If you made it to the end of this video, thank you for watching. I really appreciate it and I hope you learned something.